As climate change raises temperatures across Australia, it's fueling unprecedented bushfires. Okay, backfire behind us. What started as a small grass fire that was nearly put out has jumped into the thicker brush and is growing very quickly. It's coming up through the grass here. Water bomber overhead. You can see it's getting very, very close. And it's going to jump this. This is no fire break. It's going to go. We're getting called back. <laughs> yeah, we're going. It's spotted over the creek. Now, if it does that again and again, it gets very hard. Australian bushfires are notorious for jumping huge distances. This is largely because of the eucalyptus trees. Firefighters call them gasoline trees because fire moves incredibly fast up the trunk, along the string of bark to the canopy of the tree. Up there, broad leaves that are filled with combustible eucalyptus oil don't just burn, they explode, shooting flaming bark and leaves in all directions. Add a good wind, and fire can be thrown as far as 20 miles away. Here it comes. Wow. Water bomber. Lizard running from the fire. That's what happens. The fire just pushes all these animals out ahead and they're just running for their lives. So I'm gonna bring him over to a safe spot and let him free. Right now, there's basically nothing that the firefighters can do. They're trying to protect some of the assets, homes, farms in the area, but that's all they can do, try and slow it down. Goes to show how capricious fire actually can be. All it takes is a little ember from a fire that we thought was out to just light up the whole area. And the bigger the fire, the more erratically it can behave. Smoke devil! On rare occasions, fire whirls can develop and throw burning debris miles away. The polar bear, the world's largest land predator, is under threat. As the Arctic warms, the icy habitat of the bear is melting faster, leaving them hungry and vulnerable. Their population is dwindling as they struggle to survive the longer summers. And now, starving bears are coming into towns searching for food. I've come to their world to find out how they're coping in a fast-changing climate. Can they survive and adapt, or will the mighty polar bear become a climate casualty? With scat samples in hand, we arrive at the lab at the zoo in Winnipeg to find out if the Hudson Bay polar bear population has a future. Let's take a look at this. We got a bunch. We pull out all the samples for Dr. Peterson and log them. Every sample we analyzed was composed of a grass called sedges. The grass gives them liquid, but no nutrients. The longer they eat grass, the more their body condition deteriorates. So the idea that polar bears will be able to adapt to life on land without sea ice is really not practical. No, but we're not gonna see all the polar bears shift over to grazing and these other food sources in a short time period. Ultimately, polar bears need to be out on the ice getting seals, and if they're not getting to it or they're getting to it for fewer weeks or fewer months, it's gonna have big like population level um, impact. Without the ability to adapt to new food, the future for many polar bears is looking bleak. At the current rate of climate change, even the most northerly sea ice will melt completely in the summer, and the polar bears will have nowhere left to go. For the first time, an animal at the very top of the food chain could be wiped out by climate change. It's up to everyone, individuals, companies, and countries to continue to reduce the causes of climate change and save the polar bear. Scientists have noted much higher mortality rates in El Nino years. During the last extreme event, numbers dropped by half. At least 90% of the pups will die on the beaches of the Galapagos during extreme El Nino events. And it can take up to 10 years for the population to recover. If, as a majority of scientists think, climate change does increase the severity of El Nino as well as its frequency, the future for these animals, already listed as endangered, is more uncertain than ever.
climate disruptions have no borders and can have dire consequences spread over time and great distances. At the sub-Antarctic Bird Island in the Southern Atlantic Ocean, scientists of the British Antarctic Survey noted major die-offs among young fur seals. And these events repeated over time. Years of research have shown that El Nino also takes a toll on wildlife in the Atlantic Ocean, but two and a half years after the event begins in the Pacific. The band of warm water created by El Nino spreads down the coast of South America, rounds Cape Horn, and flows into the Atlantic, dramatically reducing marine productivity, forcing the fur seals of Bird Island to travel much further in search of food. It took two and a half years for the warm waters to reach this island in the South Atlantic. But the result is the same. The seal pups starve. The beaches of Bird Island become cemeteries in turn, a testament to the deadly reach of El Nino. Hostile weather is nothing new to Bangladesh. Seasonal rains and tropical storms hit its low-lying coast and flood its many waterways annually. But as temperatures rise worldwide, our weather is becoming more volatile, and nowhere is that felt harder than Bangladesh, a country being battered so fiercely by the effects of climate change that their existence is under threat right now. Cyclones are a product of heat and moisture. They form in the warm Indian Ocean just before and after monsoon season. As climate change warms the sea, cyclones and tropical storms get worse. The damage from past storms can be seen everywhere as I travel to meet those affected by the extreme weather here. 70 boys make this place their home. Shirajul Islam is the director of the orphanage. What were the circumstances that caused the orphanage to be formed in the first place? The orphanage is established uh, in, uh, after uh, cyclone uh, 1970. Uh, more than uh, 300,000 people uh, uh, died uh, in this area. The 1970 Bola cyclone was the deadliest tropical storm in history, with a storm surge of up to 30 feet. And since then, globally, the number of cyclones has tripled. Here in Bangladesh, hundreds of people are killed each year by storms. Most so, of uh, the students are lost uh, their father in the Bay of Bengal. So most of their fathers were fishermen? Yeah, fishermen. The country has been hit by 10 cyclones in 16 years. The last one was in 2007, when Cyclone Sadir tore through the south, devastating communities. It also coincided with some of the worst monsoon flooding the country had seen. I'm in Siberia, the coldest inhabited place on Earth. As global temperatures rise, this enormous icy land is melting. The entire region is built on top of permafrost, which is now thawing at an alarming rate. The ground is collapsing, traditional ways of life are threatened, and large amounts of previously trapped methane gas are seeping into the atmosphere. Siberia's big thaw could have a catastrophic effect on the entire planet. Every year, Dr. Fedorov and his team drill deep into the ground to analyze changes in the permafrost. How far down do you drill? Five meters, six meters. That's some tough stuff. Dr. Fedorov probes the permafrost in many locations. And what he's seeing in northern Yakutia is alarming. We have surface subsidence more than two meters. Surface su subsidence of two yeah. meters. It subsides. As the icy permafrost melts, the ground sinks. The formation of thaw ponds and lakes is rapidly increasing all over northeastern Siberia. You're seeing dramatic changes. Yes, yes. Scientists predict that the area of permafrost in the northern hemisphere will decline by 20 to 35 percent by the middle of this century, releasing a monumental amount of greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm. 